Okay, so we're there in Genesis chapter number 19. And um, last week we saw that um, God was telling Abraham basically what he was going to do with the city of Sodom. Okay, we actually we spent a couple of weeks going through um, Genesis chapter number 18. And, and, and what happened was um, after he talked with Abraham, God agreed that if there was 10 righteous people in the city, in Sodom, then he would actually spare it for their sake. Remember, he started off, he was going, he's going to destroy it, and and um, and Abraham said to him, look, you know, what about if there's righteous people? Surely you're not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. And, um, you know, and, and God said, well, look, if there's 50 righteous, I won't destroy it. And so Abraham thinks, hmm, I don't think there is 50 righteous in Sodom. And so he, the count goes down all the way down till it gets to if there's just 10. And so God says, if there's 10 righteous people, that he's going to spare it for their sake. Then we see God, he sent two angels to Sodom. And basically what he did, he sent them there to confirm their wickedness. He went to, because he'd heard the report, and obviously God knows everything, but he was setting an example that you shouldn't just believe something because someone tells you it, you know. In fact, and it amazes me how often I've seen this recently in things I've been, I've been observing overseas, for example. Someone says something and people just believe it because it's a, it's a pastor who said it, or it's someone who's an authority, you know, some famous person, some person of, of importance says something, and people just automatically believe it. We shouldn't believe things without checking it out. And so he gives us the example. He'd heard the report, but he sends them to see whether or not the report of how bad they were was actually true. So in this chapter, we pick up the story with the angels arriving at Sodom. Okay, And just a note, that when we, this is a, this is a story we're going to go through of something that actually happened. But it's not just a story. You see, the Bible tells, tells us in Romans chapter 15 that whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That we, through you know, comfort and patience of the Scripture, might have hope. So what it's telling us is that these things that happened, they are real things that happened, but we can learn from these. Okay, And so it's really important we understand that as we look through. So start in verse number 1. It says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. So we see they arrive, and Lot is sitting in the gate. Now, we've seen previously that sitting in the gate signified um, being in a position of authority. That's where the elders of a city, they would sit in the gate. Okay? And what does he do? He courteously gets up and he greets them. You know, he, he rises up before them. In fact, we actually remember that. The Bible talks about that. It talks about honouring the grey head and rising up before the aged, treating them with respect. When someone comes into the room, it's, it's, it's polite to stand up, you know? Or it's polite if someone's, if someone's talking to you. It's a polite thing to actually look at someone when they're talking to you. You know, if someone's talking to you, don't just sort of, oh, I'm just still doing this and still doing this. Give them your attention. That's a polite thing to do. And rising up, that's an example of that. He's being polite. He stands, you know, he rises to meet them, and then he bows himself. You know, he's polite and as he greets them. Look at verse number two. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. So <clears throat> what we see here is that he invites them to come and stay at his house, you know, which is also hospitable, you know. He says, you know, come and stay at my house. But you can actually see with what he says, you can actually tell he's actually trying to protect them. Because notice what he says here. He says, um, tarry all, you know, come to my house, tarry all night, wash your feet, and then you shall rise up early and go on your ways. It's like, come and stay at my place, and then, you know, get up early and I'll catch, I'll give you a taxi and go to the airport. It's kind of like, in some ways it's polite, but in some ways it's kind of like he wants them to move on. Now, I don't think he wants them to move on because he's being rude. What he's really doing is because he knows where they are. And he knows that Sodom is a bad place. Okay, And so he's actually trying to protect them. But what do they say? They say, no, no. They say, no, we'll just abide in the street all night. They say, no, nah, thanks for your offer, but we'll be fine. We'll just camp out here in the street. No problem. Okay, And of course, we know there are, are there places in the world where you really wouldn't want to be staying in the street at night? Absolutely. And well, Sodom is obviously one of those places. Look at verse number three. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. So Lot basically strongly insists. So he brings them to his place, and he provides a meal for them. They all sit down and eat. Everything just sort of seems normal. But now look at verse number four. But before they lay down, so they've obviously finished their eating, it's about time for them to go to bed, but before they actually go to bed, before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. 
And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. So this is saying all the men of the city surrounded the house. And they said, Bring out the men that we may know them. Now when it says we may know them, just to keep your place in Genesis 19, but just so we understand what this is talking about, um, it's important that you, you, we use the Bible to interpret the Bible. Have a look at Genesis chapter number... Well, there's a lot of places we could go. We could go Genesis chapter number 4. Genesis chapter number 4. Have a look at Genesis chapter number 4 and verse number 1. Genesis chapter 4. Because you might think, and they said, bring these men out that we may know them. What exactly is that saying? Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1 says, And Adam knew his wife... And she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. So Adam knew his wife. What happened? She got pregnant and had a child. Have a look at verse number 17. And Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bare Enoch. Um, have a look at verse number 25. And Adam knew his wife again and she bare a son and called his name Seth. So we get the idea when it, when it talks about Adam knowing his wife, it's, 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 it's a euphemism for he had relations with his wife and then a child was what resulted. Okay, well, back here in Genesis chapter 19, these men have surrounded the house and they've said, um, where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. So they're not saying bring out these men so we can get to know them and whatever. They're actually saying bring them out so that we can have a carnal knowledge of what you probably describe it as. They're saying bring them out. Okay, and so the funny thing is, well, I don't know if you call it funny, the angels, what were they sent to Sodom for? They were sent to see if the wickedness that God had heard about was as great as what he'd heard about. They were, they were sent to be witnesses. But they didn't need to go and see anything. I mean, they were... It came to them. They were, they were going to be the victims. These people, because what that's describing, all the men of the city, they wanted to know these angels. They wanted to abuse them. They wanted to have carnal relations with them. The men of the city of Sodom were homosexuals, and they wanted to commit homosexual acts with with these angels, okay? That's that's basically what it's saying. So let's have a look and see what happens. Um, bring them out and know them. Verse number six. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known <coughs> which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do you to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. So we see here Lot, first of all, he goes out and tells them not to be so wicked. He goes and says, don't be so wicked. You know, what, you, what you're suggesting is disgusting. Don't, don't be wicked. Don't do this. But then he makes them a bizarre offer. Now, do you not think this was pretty bizarre, what we saw here, what we just read? He makes a bizarre offer. Um, basically, he said, look, I've got, I've got some daughters here. Um... And he said, I've got two daughters, you know, they haven't known a man, let me bring them out to you. Now, is that the thing that you're likely to do? A, 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 a pack of homosexual rapists surround your house, are you going to say, here's my daughters? Okay? It's a pretty strange thing. Okay, keep your finger in Genesis 19 and have a look at Judges 19. Because this is not the only time this thing has happened. Um, Judges, chapter number 19, that's, um, must be about the sixth book of the Bible, I think it is. Might be helpful if I get around there. Um... Judges, chapter number 19. Judges, chapter number 19. And have a look at um, Judges, chapter 19. Look at verse number... Start in verse 16. Verse number 16 of Judges 19. It says, And behold, there came an old man from his work out of the field at even, which was also of Mount Ephraim, and he sojourned in Gibeah. But the men of the place were Benjamites. And when he lifted up his eyes, he saw a wayfaring man in the street of the city. And the old man said, Whither goest thou, and whence comest thou? <coughs> and he said unto him, We are passing from Bethlehem Judah toward the side of Mount Ephraim, from thence am I. And I went to Bethlehem Judah, but I am now going to the house of the Lord. And there is no man that receiveth me to house. Yet there is both straw and provender for our asses. And there is bread and wine also for me and for thy handmaid, and for the young men which is with thy servants. There is no want of anything. And the old man said, Peace be with thee. Howsoever, let all thy wants lie upon me, only lodge not in the street. Now doesn't this sound, remember what was what did Lot say? Lot said, you know, come in and they say, no, we'll stay in the street. And what did say, no, Lot said, no, you come in and stay with me. Here's a similar thing that's going on. In this case, this old man is telling this guy, look, come in and don't lodge in the street. Come in and, and be with me. Look down at verse number, oh, we're on to verse number 21. So he brought him into his house and gave 
provender unto the asses, and they washed their feet and did eat and drink. Verse number 22. Now, as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came unto thine house, into thine house, that we may know him. Now, doesn't this sound like, are we just reading the same story again? Isn't that what it sounds like? Okay, it sounds very, very familiar. There's a, there's a slight difference here. Notice here it also, it doesn't just say the men of the city. It actually says certain sons of Belial. Now, sons of Belial, you might think, what's, what, what's a son of Belial? Well, there's various words that are used in the Bible talking about Satan or talking about the devil. Because throughout history, there have been people, in fact, someone's talking about it before the service, people worshipping Satan, worshipping Lucifer, you know, the church of Lucifer and stuff like that. Well, people have done that. And you hear about people worshipping Baal, for example. You might have heard of Beelzebub. Beelzebub? Okay. Belial. This is, this, is this, this is what it's talking about. When people are worshipping this false god, and of course the false, when someone's worshipping a false god, who they're really worshipping is Satan, and that's what's going on. So these people here, these sons of Belial, these are people who are given over to Satan. They're worshipping Satan. They're, they're, you know, that's who they are. In fact, it says they're children of certain sons of Belial. In the New Testament, we read about that. I mean, in fact, I didn't have it in my notes, but just, it might be worth seeing. Jesus actually said this to some people in John chapter 8. Um, I won't go through the whole thing now, but in John chapter 8, Jesus, when talking to um, some Pharisees who were, who heard all of his words, saw his miracles, but they just refused to believe him, he said, um, da 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 uh, mm, um, just look, verse number eight, oh, verse number eight. Uh, so chat, John eight verse forty. He says, "But now you seek to kill me." This is Jesus speaking. A man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then say, said they to him, "We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God." Jesus said unto them, "If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came of myself, but He sent me. Why do you not understand my speech?" even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh the lie, he speaketh his own, for he is a lie and the father of. So Jesus talks about people saying, you are of your father, the devil. You are the children of the devil. Here we see people saying that they are their sons of Belial. So look back in Judges chapter 19, and let's see what happens. Verse number 23, Judges 19, verse number 23. And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them, and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is come into mine house, do not this folly. Verse 24, Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. Verse number 25, But the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them, and they knew her, there it goes, and abused her all the night until the morning, and when the day began to spring, they let her go. <clears throat> then came the woman the dawning day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And, um, uh, and the Lord rose up in the morning, opened the doors of the house, and he went out to go his way, and behold, the woman his concubine was fallen down at the door of the house, and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up, let us be going, but none answered. So what had happened is these people had been abused. So these people had abused this woman until she was dead. That's what had happened. So go back to Genesis chapter number 19. Look back at Genesis chapter 19. Now, so we see this it's described, it's, it's a similar situation, it's described as vile, they abuse this woman. Back back in Genesis chapter number 19. Obviously, it's a, very, it's a very bad thing that happened in both of these accounts to offer a woman to a band of rapists. That's a bad thing to do. Okay, And we need to understand, God is not condoning rape in this. Like some people will read a story about something that happened in the Bible and say, well, look what God's doing, or God approves of this because it happened. Well, no, we need to realize that, that the Bible, part of the Bible, is a history book. It records things that happened. And guess what? People have done and continue to do bad, wicked things. And when it's rec it's recorded for our learning, we can learn things from this. But in no way, shape or form does God say, hey, this is a good idea. Let's do that. You know? And so it's important we understand that there are stories in the Bible versus statements. Like if God said, hey, rape is good. Go rape someone. Then you'd have there'd be an issue. 
but nowhere does God say that. In fact, we'll see in a minute that God's actually got laws against it. Okay, so back in back in Judges, that this woman she was raped and she actually died. There actually there ended up being a civil war basically when all the other tribes surrounded the city where these men were that had done that. And they said, what wickedness is this that is done among you? And they said, deliver us the men, the children of Belial, that we may put them to death. Now, when they, were do when they did that, when they said that, that was actually, you know, that was the right thing to do. Because the death penalty was on there. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter number 22, verse 25, it says, But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her. Force her and lie with her. What's that? If you force someone and lie with them, that's rape. Okay, force her and lie with her. Then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbour and slayeth him, even so is this matter. So there was other laws that were listed there. And it talked about the fact, if you've got someone who's married, and then she sleeps with someone, then there was actually the death penalty for both of them. But here it's saying, look, if this happens, and it's just the man has forced her, he gets put to death. Nothing happens to her because she's done nothing wrong. It's saying it's just, this is just the same as if someone gets, you know, um, someone comes upon his neighbour and slayeth him in the field. It's not her fault at all. It's the man's fault and he gets put to death, okay? So we need to understand that, that God had the death penalty on rape. So there's no way that God is condoning, but this is still describing what actually happened, okay? And so you might think, well, what could that, why would that be? Why would it be that in these cases that there would be a... Um, uh, yeah, why would why would he do this? Why would he um, offer his daughters as opposed to um, you know when when they're coming looking for the men? And the thing that, that I, I suppose that that comes to my mind is the thought that basically what it is, it's homosexuality is such a wicked sin. Okay, it is something that is described in the Bible as being vile, and I mean God had the death penalty on it. Okay, there was the, the, there was the death penalty on some thing, on on certain things, you know, on murder, on rape, on you know people committing adultery, people who've made a promise and they're breaking that vow. Okay, there were death penalty on those sorts of things. But if someone, if two people just committed fornication, for example, there wasn't the death penalty on that. But if people committed, you know, homosexual fornication, there was the death penalty. In fact, it says in Leviticus 20.13, if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them are committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. And so, I think within this, something we can grasp from the story is that it's as bad as we think rape is, that homosexuality is, is worse than that. Now, rape is bad, and it deserves a death penalty, but homosexuality is worse, because in both of these stories, we see the same thing happening. We see it would be better if this happened, which is a vile, terrible thing. But the fact is that that just gives us a picture of how bad it is. But let's continue on and see what happens, because there's a lot we can learn from this. Look at verse number nine. Verse number nine. What, what's their response? He offers them them. In verse number nine, it says, And then, and they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came into sojourn. See, so he's like, you know, he's, he's coming and visiting and, you know, visiting with us. This one came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. So the first thing they do, they accuse Lot of what? So you come in and you're, what are you? You're going to be a judge. Okay, because what do you say to them? Don't do so wickedly. And they're saying, hey, you're judging us. Now, haven't you heard that today? Don't judge. Judge not. We shouldn't judge people. But the thing is, the Bible, Jesus actually said, judge righteous judgment. We should judge righteous judgment. It says, the spiritual man judgeth all things. Psalm 37 says, the Lord loveth judgment. Because judgment is actually talking about justice. It's talking about what's right. And if you don't judge, what you're really saying is, there's no such thing as right and wrong. There's no such thing as good and bad. Because if you can't judge, it's just, hey, whatever. There is no right, there is no wrong. That's what the judge not comes about okay and so the, the funny thing is in the same way he said what you're going to do is wicked and they said don't judge what would happen if you say today homosexuality is wicked homosexuality is wrong what will people say don't judge don't judge that's exactly what they'll say okay keep um oh and also notice that and that's a funny thing they actually acknowledge that it's bad because it actually says here this one fellow came in da -da, he needs to be a judge now will we deal worse with thee than with them so for them to say, we're going to do worse to you than we were going to do to them, doesn't that mean 
that what they were going to do to them was bad. Because if something's worse, then the other thing is still bad. You know, you don't have like good and worse. You have bad and worse. You see what I'm saying? So they acknowledge it. And you often see that with the things these people say, like these crazy things where they, I mean, what's the latest thing they have now? They have all these genders, don't they? How many genders are there? It's just like multiple, multiple, multiple different genders that you can be. Uh, depending on where you are, there's all sorts of, 30 or something like that. It's, cra it's crazy. But even within, what do they call it, the LGBT? What's B? B stands for bisexual, doesn't it? What does bisexual mean? Two. So there's only two. They're actually admitting there's a, they really know that there's only two. No matter if they can pretend there's 10 or 20 or 50, there's really only two, okay? And like they're saying, look, we're going we're gonna to do worse with thee because they know that what they're doing, they're doing wrong. And also what they're going to do, they're going to use force. They're going to use force. They're going to force what they want to happen. That's what they're doing. They're going to force it to happen. Look at verse number 10. Verse number 10. But the men put forth their hand, so this is speaking about the angels, put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. And they smote the men were at the door, that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. So it has a better outcome here than it had in Judges 19. Because remember in Judges 19, the poor woman gets killed. Here, the angels are there, and they say, this is not going to happen. Lot, you come in, shut the door, and then the people outside, they just strike them blind. Okay, and so they're, they're, they're blind. They, they, they know, they're not able to actually find their way in. But the funny thing is, even though they've been struck blind, did they stop? What does it say? It says, um, the men were at the door of the house struck them with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. So if you'd been struck blind, what would you do? Would you take off? Would you think, I better get out of here, this is bad. Okay, that would be the natural thing to do. But these people are so crazy, they've been struck blind, and they're still trying to find the door. They're still trying to break in. Okay, so it's probably good. It's a good thing that the angels were there in this case, that no one actually you know, got killed um, because of what they're trying to do. But it's just an interesting thing. In fact, what it actually describes, the turn if you were to Romans chapter 1, this describes one of the characteristics that's given in this list. There's a, there's a word called implacable. Implacable. And we'll find this in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, have a look at verse number 26. And this word implacable, if you heard the word placate, to placate, it's kind of like means to like to pacify someone, you know, if you, if you placate them, you satisfy them, you give them what you want, placate. If someone's implacable, it means you can't satisfy them. It's impossible to satisfy them. They are never satisfied, okay? Have a look at this list in Romans chapter 1, verse 26. It says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their woman to change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving themselves that recompense of the error which was meet. And even as, so it's, this is what it's talking about, the same thing, homosexuality. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Okay, that, and implacable, that's these guys, you couldn't placate them, they weren't satisfied, and unmerciful, that sounds like the guys in Judges 19. Do they show mercy to that lady? No. Who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. All I thought was only in the Old Testament that, that the death penalty was de deserved. He says no. It says it, it's worthy of death. Turn back to Genesis chapter number 19. Genesis chapter number 19. Um, verse number 12. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law, thy sons, thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For <clears throat> we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. So the angels basically tell Lot, Look, get your whole family, because we are going to destroy the city. They went to investigate. I mean, they've seen enough. What more do they need to see? They only went in there. They don't, you know, they hadn't been in there long, and suddenly they're surrounded and people are trying to, um, you know, commit this, this violence with them. Verse number 14. Um, and Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters. So Lot, he's obviously got, he's got his two daughters which hadn't known man, but he's also got other daughters, because he's got son-in-laws. 
Okay, so he's got more than just the two daughters. He's got these other daughters who are already married and still living in Sodom. So Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Um, and so what this is kind of talking about is the fact that um, Lot, he, he, has a bad, he has a bad testimony, basically, with his family. Because he tells them about this, and what do they think? They think he's joking. You know? They, they don't believe him. You know? And so he's saying, look, this whole city's going to be destroyed, and they're not going to pay, pay attention. Now, we can learn from that. If we have a bad testimony, and we try and tell people what the Bible says, what God says, are they going to take us seriously? No, we see you. You're, you're off down the pub. You're drinking. You're doing this. You know, Look at the life you live. Are they going to pay any attention? Okay? And the fact is, having a good testimony is going to help people listen to you. Okay, that's one of the reasons that we, we should have a good testimony. I mean, you could contrast Lot with Noah. I mean, Noah, he told his family, what did his family do? They all got on the ark. His sons and their wives, they got on the ark. Okay, Lot's family, they just, they just, they just thought he was joking. Okay, um, look at verse number, verse number 15. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest they be consumed in the iniquity of the city. So he's saying, look, just take your wife and your daughters, the ones which are here in the house, take them, and, and you need to get out of here. Verse number 16. Excuse me. Verse number 16. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they brought them forth that he said, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest they, be cons lest they be consumed. So we see here, what's Lot doing? He's lingering. He's, he's dragging his feet. You know, he, I mean, you think if they come and say, Look, this is what's going to happen. You take your family and you get out of there. But he's... It doesn't seem like he's dragging his feet. He's, he's not in a hurry. The thing about Lot is, he should never have pitched his tent towards Sodom in the first place. He should never have been looking at Sodom in the first place. He should never have gone and gone to live there. And now, he's still attached to it. So he doesn't want to leave. You know, he doesn't want to leave Sodom. But what do they do? They actually, um, they physically, they physically bring him out. You know, it says, um, when they brought them forth abroad, you know, they actually physically brought them out. He, he, he laid, um, oh yeah, while he lingered, back in verse 16, the men laid hold upon his hand, upon the hand of his wife, upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful on them, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. So the angels actually took them out of the city. They took them out there, okay? Um, and so, yeah, they, they, they bring that, and they also, they warn them not to look back. So it says there, um, escape for thy life, verse 17, look not behind thee. So they bring them out and they warn them not to look back. That's kind of like a picture of not looking back toward our previous life. So after you get saved, you should leave your previous life behind. You should take the bad things that you were doing, the sinful things, and turn your back on them. And don't look back at them. Okay? Because you, you'll often see people after they get saved, sometimes you'll hear, and, and preachers do this, and especially preachers who who preach a false gospel, who preach you've got to turn from your sins to be saved, well, they talk about it a lot. They say, well, I was this, and I was that, and I used to do this, and I used to do that, you know? And sometimes it's worse that. Sometimes they'll even talk about things as though they're funny stories, these funny things that used to happen. You know, maybe they used to be a drunk, and they used to have these things happen at parties, and so-and-so crashed the car, and this happened here, and this happened. And it's, what it's doing is it's glorifying sin. And that's not something we should do. We shouldn't, we shouldn't look back. We should... We should turn and, you know, look at the way we're going now and not look back at the old life, you know. Because the thing about it is, is if you look back at the old life, you'll actually have opportunity to go back there. It says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 15, it says, And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, if they'd been thinking about where they came from, they might have had opportunity to have returned. And that's, you know, there's many applications. One of them was with, with the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. You know, and they would they weren't supposed to be thinking, oh, what what was the food like in Egypt? Because then they're gonna they're gonna want to go back. Okay? And so that's we shouldn't be mindful of those things. We should leave that behind. And he says, Don't they were warned, don't look behind, don't look back. Verse number eighteen. And Lot said, said unto them, so they've said, Take them and escape 
Don't stay in the plain. Escape to the mountain lest you be consumed. And Lot said unto him, O oh, not so, my lord. O oh, not so, my lord. Verse 19. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast shown unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. So Lot asks for a compromise. He wants to flee to a nearby place. There's a place, if we look at verse number 22, the name, therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. So there's a city nearby called Zoar. He wants to basically just go there. But the thing about Zoar is it was probably just as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah were. I mean, if we look back in Genesis chapter 14, the king of Zoar was with the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah. They were all on the same side fighting in a battle. Okay? It's very near... Chances are it's just the same place. In fact, it would have been, because that's why the angel said go there, because it was all of the cities on the plain is what was going to be destroyed. Okay, And, and notice how he's, he's trying to downplay it. Because he's saying, look, you know, um, is it not a little one? Is it not a little one? He's saying, look, this is, it's just a little one, surely. And that's kind of the same thing in our lives. People say, oh, this sin, it's just a little sin. It's just a little one. But the thing about little sins is that little sins grow. And so that's why we need to fight against sin, because it grows from little. You know, the Bible says a, says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Just a little bit, it spreads, okay? Um, verse number 21, verse number 21. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow the city for which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. So the angels, they do, that they allow Lot to flee there and not destroy it. And part of this is kind of, it pictures how even with our compromise, God actually allows us. You know, he doesn't for, they're not forced to go somewhere else. He actually allows them, you know, and it, it does show that, you know, God, he gives us this choice. He gives us this freedom. But having said that, what ends up happening is it's not good. Okay, have a look in, um, uh, have a look in verse number 23 and see what happens. Verse number 23. And the Lord, sorry, and the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. So God, the Lord, he destroys Sodom with fire and brimstone. Now, this gives us a pretty good idea of what God thinks of the sin of homosexuality. Okay, now, I'm not, now, I'm not re-preaching last week's sermon. We looked at all those verses. You know, we saw Leviticus um, 20.13. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them commit an abomination, they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. We saw that. Okay, we saw, and in fact, I re if, you, if you weren't here, if you didn't hear those ones, have a listen to Genesis 18, part 2. Have a listen to that sermon. Also, we touched on some things on the Sunday morning sermon. I think it was examples for us today. We looked in, in starting in 2 Peter chapter 2. Have a listen to those things, and, and, because it's important you get an understanding of this. But you see, some people will say, sure, okay, so God did that. That was what God thought about homosexuality back then. But some people will say, but Jesus didn't condemn homosexuality. Jesus was friends with publicans and sinners. He was friends with homos. That's what they say. They'll say that about Jesus. Well, what that shows is that they either don't understand or they don't believe the Bible. Because according to what we just read there, according to verse 24, who destroyed Sodom? Verse 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. So who destroyed it? God, didn't he? The Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? Turn to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse number 10. <clears throat> Isaiah 43 and verse number 10. <clears throat> Isaiah 43 and verse number 10. Isaiah 43 says 10, in verse 10, and, and back, in, back in Genesis 19, note when it said Lord, it had capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's a special name of God. Okay? There are some places where you might have heard the name Jehovah, which you'll only find in the, in the well, of proper Bibles, you'll only, you'll only find, in regular English Bibles, you'll only find in the King James. It's gone, Jehovah's gone from the new, um, all these new versions and stuff. But that's the, that's the name that's behind. This is talking about God, the Lord, Jehovah, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Verse number 10 of Isaiah 43 says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, 
and my servant whom I've chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Notice those words, I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Saviour. Notice that, there's no Saviour apart from the Lord. I have declared and have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore you, my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he. Notice that, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon, I have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans, whose cry is in the ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. So he's telling who he is, I'm the Lord, I'm your Redeemer, I'm the Saviour, and I'm the only one. I am God. That's what he says. Actually, have a look at chapter 44, verse number 6. Check Isaiah chapter 44 and verse number 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. So he's the first and the last. There is no God apart from him. Have a look at Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 8. Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 8, page 1236. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 8. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So who's speaking here? This is God. This is Almighty God. Verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. So this is, this is God. We heard it in Isaiah 43. We're hearing it now. I'm the first and the last. What thou sayest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice which spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Who's the Son of Man that we read about throughout the New Testament? Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle, and his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were flame of, as a flame of fire, his feet like undefined brass, as if they burned in a furnace, his voice as the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. I am the first and I am the last. So this is still the same person who's talking. I am he, notice this, that liveth and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Who was, who's this that, that liveth and was dead and is alive forevermore? Who's the one who's died and is alive forevermore? This is Jesus Christ. That's the Son of Man. This is who it is. Jesus Christ is the Lord God. Because what do we see in Isaiah? He was called the Saviour. In fact, he was the only Saviour. Well, isn't Jesus Christ the Saviour? The Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. He is the Saviour. Jesus is our Redeemer. How, how often does it say that? So what we need to understand is Jesus Christ, when we read a bit in the Old Testament about the Lord, that's Jesus. Jesus is God. You see, the Bible says that without controversy, great is the mystery of Godliness. God, 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on the world, received up into glory. And in fact, that verse, because it, it says God at the start, and it's got all these things, you could say, you know, God was manifest in the flesh. You know, God was seen of angels. God was preached unto Gentiles. You know, God was believed on in the world. God was received up into glory. That, that's, that's grammatically, that's what it's saying. Jesus Christ is and was God. Okay, And so when we see something that the Lord does in the Old Testament, that's the same as Jesus. So just because Jesus, when he was on the earth at that time, didn't do anything, didn't destroy any you know, cities populated by homosexuals, that doesn't mean that it's not the same God. Okay, He doesn't need to, he's already done it. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. He's the same. He says, I'm the Lord, I change not. Okay, so... When God says something, Jesus is saying it. You know, God's view of Sodom is the same as Jesus' view because Jesus is God. He doesn't change. In fact, we see the same thing. I mean, it says in, in Jude, for example, Jude chapter 1, verse 7, 
Sodom and Gomorrah were set forth an example. Jude 1 7 says, even as and Jude is it's the book before Revelation. So it's practically the end of the New Testament. It says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. Now, isn't it strange when a man desires a man? Isn't that strange? Going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. They're an example. Okay, so God hasn't changed his mind. Okay, let's get back to Genesis 19 because I don't want to spend too long on this. But as I say, yeah, listen to those other sermons because it's important we understand this. Okay, and as I, as I made clear the other week, I don't, I don't agree with this view where people say, well, therefore we have to go around yelling and screaming and hating on homos and stuff like that. I don't see where the Bible says we need to do that at all. I don't. I mean, my Bible says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I will preach it to every single person. That will allow me to. I'll preach it to everyone, because that's what he said to do. I won't withhold the gospel from someone. Now, do I believe that there are people who are beyond hope of salvation? Yes, because Jesus talked about it. It said that there was people that it was impossible for them to believe. It says God has hardened their hearts, blinded their eyes, lest they should believe. But that's not up to me. That's up to God. He said, preach the gospel. every. So I will give it to you. Now, personally, I, ha I haven't seen any homosexual get saved. Never have. I've seen, I've given the gospel to many of them, and some of them have, you know, um, have listened and have understood. But I've never had any get saved. But I'll, I'll give the gospel. Okay? Um, so it's important. We un but we need to understand we're not what you call a homosexual friendly church. I'll give the gospel to anyone, but I'm not going to, like if you have friends and relatives and whatever, don't invite them here. Okay, because the Bible says if someone's a drunk, if someone's a fornicator, they need to be thrown out of the church. Well, guess what? Homosexuals are not welcome here either. I'll go out and knock people's doors and preach the gospel to them, but they're not welcome in here. Because the thing is, when you look in the Bible and see what they did, <coughs> what were they doing in Genesis 19? They were abusing people. What were they doing in Judges 19? They were abusing people. You can even look back, there's an account in, um, uh, back in um, Genesis 9 with Noah. After Noah got off the ark, he made himself drunk in his tent. And it's, it's a bit vague, you've got to sort of draw a few conclusions. It doesn't specifically say, but it certainly sounds like something. Noah was in his tent, he was drunk and he was naked. And when he was, yeah, he, he was drunk and he was naked and something happened to him. Because it says he knew what his younger son had done unto him. Okay, his son had done something to him, and he was naked. We don't know what that was, but Noah, when he woke up, what did he do? He pronounced a curse upon Canaan. Okay, now remember, Noah had three sons: Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay, and Canaan was um, was the son of Ham. Okay, he was Ham's son, and Ham wasn't the youngest. I think Shem was actually the youngest. Japheth was the elder. Shem was the youngest. So Ham was in the middle. Okay? Now, I've heard people say that it was Ham who did it. Well, no, because he wasn't the younger son. He was the middle son. But Canaan, and of course the Bible does, call, if, someone, you can, if someone's a grandson, they can be called a son. Just like a grandfather can be called a father. I mean, Jesus Christ, you know, the, the, son, of, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay? And so, but what did Noah do? He pronounced the curse on Canaan. Well, where did all this happen? Sodom and Gomorrah. Where was Sodom and Gomorrah? Right in the middle of the land of Canaan. Okay, and that's, that's what we see. We see this curse was pronounced, and then we see, and God, dis they destroyed the cities. God did it there, but even when he told them to go in, there were certain places, the places inside Canaan, when they, when they went in and fought in, against them in battle, what did God say to do? He said to wipe them out. Absolutely everyone, wipe them out. Okay, the other cities that weren't there, he said, you know, if they make peace with you, that's fine, they can be your servants and all that sort of stuff. But with these ones, he said, wipe them out completely. Okay? And you've got to ask yourself, why would that be? Okay? Because it sounds pretty horrific. Man, woman, and children. Okay? Now, the thing is, we understand the Bible talks, and this is a whole other topic. When children die, where do they go? They go to heaven. Okay? You might think it sounds pretty horrific, but the fact is, what would be better? To die and go to heaven as a child, or to be raised in a city full of homosexuals and no doubt be abused and have all sorts of vile things happen to you? Which would you rather have? Okay, Let's get back to Genesis 19 because we don't want to take too long. Genesis chapter 19, back in verse number 26. Verse number 26. <clears throat> verse number 26. It says, But his wife looked back 
from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. So Lot's wife, she's a warning to not do what? Not to look back. When God says something, he means it. Okay, and one of um, might have been one of my family was asking about the, you know, why is it a, why did they turn into a pillar of salt? Well, the Bible talks about um, salt being like an, an everlasting covenant. For example, it says in, in, actually have a look in Numbers, I didn't write it down, but Numbers 18, Numbers 18, 19, uh, Numbers 18, 19, for example, says Numbers 18, 19, well, here. All the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer unto the Lord have I given thee, and thy sons and thy daughters with thee, by a statute, notice this, forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord unto thee and to thy seed with thee. So salt is a, because salt is a preservative. It's something that makes things last. And so the covenant of salt is saying it's something that lasts forever. And so when, 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 God, you know, when, when Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt, obviously for looking back, but it's like a note to say, Remember this, and remember it forever. Okay, this is something we should remember. What happened to Lot's wife? Because God, He doesn't change. He hasn't changed. I mean, you read about it today. I read about it. Was it Eugene Peterson, this guy who who wrote a Bible, a supposed Bible called the Message? And it's just so ridiculous when you read it. It's nothing like the actual Bible. But surprise, surprise. Yep, homosexual marriage. It's all gay. It's it's, it's all fine. Great. You know, just bring the gays in. That's what they say. Out there in mainstream Christianity, that's what's happening. But we stand and believe that the Bible is true. And it doesn't change. It doesn't matter if anyone, everyone else changes, this doesn't change. You know, It says, I am the Lord, I change not. And God's word doesn't change. I mean, Jesus, what did he say? Think that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. He said, I've only come to destroy, but to fulfill. He says, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall be removed from the law till all be fulfilled. He didn't come to change. It's still the same, you know. So let's move on. Verse number 27. We do need to finish up. Uh, verse number 27. <clears throat> and Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. Now, <clears throat> this, is an this is an interesting thing. It says, Abraham, what did he do? He got up early in the morning. This is, this is worth taking a, a, just a, a few quick minutes to look at this. Look at Genesis chapter number 21, verse number 14. Genesis 21, verse number 14. And it says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning. Have a look at chapter 22 and verse number 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. Doesn't it seem to be a common theme? Now you might say, oh, maybe Abraham, he was just a morning person. He was just a, he was just a morning person. Okay, have a look at um, Genesis chapter number, well, I've lost my place. Uh, chapter 28, chapter 28, verse 18. And we see Jacob, chapter 28 and verse 18. And Jacob rose up early in the morning. So this is his grandson. Jacob rose up early in the morning. Have a look at, um, oh, I'm thinking it must be Exodus, I didn't write down the reference. Have a look at Exodus 8, 20, must be. Must be Exodus chapter 8 and verse 20. Exodus chapter 8 and verse number 20. And the Lord said unto Moses, rise up early in the morning. Have a look at chapter 9 and verse 13. And the Lord said unto Moses, rise up early in the morning. Look at Joshua, Joshua, Joshua chapter number, uh, I said Judges was the sixth book, it must be the seventh, Joshua is the sixth. Um, Joshua chapter number three and verse number one, Joshua chapter three and verse number one, and Joshua rose up, rose early in the morning. Chapter six and verse twelve, chapter six and verse twelve, chapter six and verse twelve, and Joshua rose early in the morning. Chapter 7 and verse 16. Chapter 7 and verse 16. Um, so Joshua rose up early in the morning. Um, chapter 8 and verse number 10. Chapter 8 and verse number 10. And Joshua rose up early in the morning. And we could look throughout, we could look throughout the, the book of Judges. We could see, for example, Gideon rising up early. We could look at Hannah, a great godly woman. Guess what she did? Rose up early. We could look at Samuel. What did he do? Rose up early. We could look at David rose up early. We could look at Job, who was described as the most righteous man upon earth. What did he do? Rose up early. How about Psalm 57? Look at Psalm number 57. Psalm 57 and verse number 8. Psalm number 57 and verse number 8. Psalm 57 verse 8. It says, I love this when I read this sometimes in the morning, in fact. Awake up, my glory. Awake, sultry and harp. I myself will 
Awake early, the psalmist says. Look at Psalm 108. Psalm 108 and verse number 2. Psalm 108 and verse number 2. Psalm 108 verse 2 says, Awake, sultry and harp, I myself will awake early. Look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119 and verse 147. Psalm 119 and verse number 147 says, I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried, I hoped in thy word. When you prevent something, that's talking about going before. So before the dawning of the morning, in other words, he got up before it was dawn. He got up early. Um, Proverbs chapter number 31. Proverbs chapter number 31. This is describing the, the, you know, the, Proverbs, the Proverbs woman. Um, oh, oh, actually, oh, I haven't got the verse written down. But it does. It, it talks about it. Uh, she ariseth also, there it goes, verse 15. She arises also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household to portion to her babes. She gets up while it's still dark, and she's cooking. You know, that's, that's the Proverbs 31 woman. She's described that. And in fact, in Proverbs, we won't turn to them because time's getting on, but there's lots of warnings in the book of Proverbs about what? About sleep. It talks about the sluggard. You know, as the door turneth upon his hinges, so the sluggard or the slothful turns upon his bed. You know, over and over, there's lots of different warnings about sleeping too much, you know, and rising up early. That's an important thing that God says that we should do. Okay, Abraham is described as a great godly man, and that's what he did. Now, just to have some balance here, just so we realize, Psalm, have a look at Psalm 127. Have a look at Psalm 127. Psalm 127, very great psalm. Psalm 127 says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Verse 2, It is vain for you to rise up early to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. So we need to realise, I'm not saying we should do without sleep. Okay, we, we do need sleep, we do need sleep to function. But we need to understand that it's a, it's a good thing to rise early. It's not a coincidence that all these people that we saw rose up early. They got up early. God desires us to be up early. Because when you get up early, you can give God the first part of your day. Often, if you, if you sleep in, you get up. Has anyone ever slept in and got up late? You know, you get up late and, you, and you're running late and you, you, oh, you haven't had the chance to do the things you should. It's like you, ne it's like you never catch up. Whereas when you get up early, you can get time in prayer. You can have time in the Word. You can do those things when you get up early. When you study, you can be up early because you're before everyone. You know, when you're up early, there's great benefits to doing that. But at the same time... Um, we, we do need to have a balance, you know. I'm not saying if you're, if you're up really late at night, if you've got to be up late at night, I'm not saying you need to get by with just minimal hours of sleep, you know. You need to be sensible. Our bodies aren't designed to rise up really early and stay up really late. Burn the candle at both ends. You can do it for a while, but eventually you're going to crash and burn, okay. So it's important that we, we do get sleep. And he says, look, he giveth his beloved sleep. And In fact, even this verse, it said, it's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late. It's vain for you to do that. But that doesn't mean that, what it's saying is, if we look back at verse number one, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wake it by the vein. It says it's vain to build a house, or it's vain to, to, to be a watchman. No, what it's saying is it's vain unless God's building the house, unless God's keeping the city. So, in other words, just doing it in your own strength, doing it by yourself, but if you're doing it because God wants you to do it, absolutely we should do it, and God will help us to do that. And the thing is, with all these things, we should, have, we should have priorities in our life. I mean, that's why the people like Abraham found time to pray. Because they made it a priority. And if you've got something in your life, you think, I should do this, but I've got this reason why I can't. Then what I do is I find a way to do what you need to do. And if that means in order to be, if, if there's a reason you have to be up late, then if that means having a sleep during the day, having a nap during the day, so you can be there, then do that. That makes perfect sense. I've done that myself many times. I've been shattered. I've come home. I'm really exhausted. I want to go soul winning. So I've gone and had half an hour sleep. Okay, and you wake up and then the first 20 minutes after you feel really terrible. But it, but it does. It gives you a second wind. And then you can go out and do the stuff that needs to be done. But it's important that we understand. Abraham, he rose up early. And in fact, these are all examples looked at the, in the Old Testament. What about in the New Testament? Look at this. Look at Jesus. Turn to Mark chapter number 1. Mark chapter number 1. Jesus is our greatest example. Mark chapter number one and verse number Mark chapter one and verse number thirty-five. This is Jesus. And it says, And in the morning, Jesus Mark one thirty-five, 
rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. What did Jesus do? Got up early, went into a solitary place and prayed. Um, John chapter 8, verse number 2. John chapter 8, verse number 2. John 8, 2. And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. Early, early in the morning was when he came into the temple. Last one, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 and verse number 45. Luke 22 and verse number 45. Luke twenty two forty five 45 says... <clears throat> And he, when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. So he's saying, Look, get up, stay awake, pray, so that you don't, so lest you enter into temptation. Because the thing is, we're all tempted to do things we shouldn't do. But when we give in to things that we know we shouldn't do and give in to it, it makes it easier to give in to other things. Okay? And so it's important, we, we need to resist, when we resist urges to do what's wrong, that gives us more strength to resist urges and other things. Because God's going to help us. God's going to help us do that. You know, we, we don't want to fall into the temptation of the devil. Okay? Well, the Bible says resist the devil, and he's going to flee from you. We need to resist the temptation that, 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 that's out there. Okay, um, let's get back to Genesis, because we need to finish up. Genesis chapter 9, 19. Genesis 19, verse number... 28, verse number 28. And he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. So Lot was saved, but obviously he wasn't the best example of how a believer should be, was he? How a believer should live. He was saved, notice here, from physical destruction and it was kind of through Abraham. Isn't that what it says here? I mean, Abraham was the first one who actually said, you're not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked, are you? And, you know, and, and went down to until there was only ten left. But also it says here that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. So it's like God had, you know, kindness on, Ab on Lot because of Abraham. And that gives us a picture of the fact that our obedience to God, as Abraham was obedient to God, when Lot really wasn't, can profit others. Okay. But of course, likewise, our disobedience can also affect others. So when we're obedient, that can have an impact on other people's lives. When we're disobedient, that can have an impact. And that, I mean, that counts within a church. You know, when you obey God and do what's right, that affects the other people in this church. When you disobey God and do what's wrong, that affects the other people in this church. We need to understand that. Within a family, when you obey God, when you disobey God, you are affecting your own family, your church family, the people around you. Okay, There is an effect that, that comes through there. Look at verse number 30. Verse number 30. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zoar and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. So Lot didn't end up staying in Zoar after all that. After saying, look, you know, save that, that little one. He didn't end up staying there. Why didn't he stay there? It says, because... He was afraid. Okay, um, it says da 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 da. For he feared to dwell in Zoar. Why? Why do you think? Why was he afraid? I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. But maybe, maybe it's because of that he, although he was saved, he wasn't living the most righteous life. And the Bible says the wicked flee. Proverbs twenty eight one. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Being righteous will give you boldness. Being wicked will make you afraid. Um, verse number thirty one. And the firstborn <clears throat> said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father, let us make him drink wine this night also, and go therein and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. Okay, now... That's a pretty horrific story that we've just read, isn't it? A story of drunkenness, a story of incense, uh, so incest, excuse me, drunkenness and incest. 
which interestingly often go together drunkenness and incest often go together you see and as i pointed out before just because the bible gives an account of something that doesn't mean god approves it okay do you think god approved of this drunkenness and incest no definitely not okay but there are things that we can learn from this account one thing is that we can learn lot's daughters most likely they because it's a pretty perverted thing isn't it to get your father drunk and to sleep with him perverted well look they most likely picked up some pretty perverted ideas where do you think they got them from where they just come from from sodom they picked up these perverted ideas in sodom well whose fault was it for taking them to sodom it was Lot's fault. Okay, and so what we need to learn from that is fathers need to protect their families from harm. The damage that was done to his family because of where he took them. Because he looked at Sodom, pitched his tent, and went there, and look what happened. I mean, if he knew that that was going to happen, do you think he would have thought, I'll pitch my tent somewhere else, I'll go somewhere else? Definitely, he would have, okay? And so, as fathers, we need to protect our families from harm. And there's lots of harm that can come into a family. And the father, he's like, he's got to guard it. He's got to say, look, I'm not going to allow this into my house. I'm not going to allow it. Because, hey, this is going to be an influence in my house. I'm not going to allow it. Because you can see the harm that causes. You know, I mean, television is a great example of this. You see the wicked things. Because looking at the TV is kind of like looking towards Sodom. In fact, it really is today. I mean, if you went back a few years, it wouldn't be as much. But is it like looking at it now? I mean, how many TV programs can you look at before there's going to be, you know, homosexuality portrayed as something good? Pretty much all of them, aren't they? That's what that sort of portrayed as. You know, other things. I mean, these, these are things I don't let into my children's lives. For example, I don't let... My, my children, they don't have cell phones. They don't have cell phones. They don't have smartphones. Okay? Because there's bad things that can come into people's lives through them. Now, at some stage, they will be old enough, and they will... They're going to be adults, and they're going to have to deal with those things. But I don't want them to have to deal with that. I don't want to have them to deal with that when they're teenagers. I don't want to. I don't want them to have to. So I protect them from that, so that when they're older, when they're stronger... You see, I don't want my children to have to go out and fight with someone, have a physical fight out in the street with someone. I don't want them to. I, I want to protect them from that. But when they're older... When they're a man, when they have their own family, they might have to fight to protect their own family. That's what a man should do. That's a normal thing to do. He would protect his wife, protect his children. But I don't want them to have to do that when they're younger. I don't want them to have the things that, that the world has. I mean, how many children today do you see that have a smartphone? And right on the smartphone, click of a button, pornography. Right there. Do children really need to have to deal with that? No. So fathers should protect does it mean that, hey, they're going to be, people think, oh, well, that's a bit strange? Well, to be honest, if your children went to school, they would think that was a bit strange. Well, guess what? Our children get homeschooled. I'm very glad about that as well. You know, in fact, I should, really should preach a whole sermon on one these days. Why, why do we homeschool? Why have we got in a sign saying we're a church that supports homeschooling? Because it's normal. Where in the Bible do you see believers? Where, you know, where do you see the old Israelites in the Old Testament? Where do you see believers in the New Testament taking their children and sending them off to unbelievers to educate? Where do you see that? You know, the, the Israelites packing their children on a school bus and sending them off to the Philistines. If you did that, do you know what would happen? What would come back from school? A bunch of little Philistines would come back. Okay? Are we surprised by this? Okay? Fathers need to protect their children. So that's the first thing we can learn here. A lot didn't do it, and look what happened. Okay? Um, what's, what's the second thing we can learn? Um, how about this? The dangers of alcohol. The dangers of alcohol. It often leads to abuse. Have a look at Proverbs chapter number 23. Proverbs chapter number 23. <coughs> Proverbs 23. Alcohol is a dangerous thing. Proverbs chapter 23, and verse number 20, says, Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsy shall clothe the man with rags. Look down at um, uh, verse number 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, look not thou upon the wine when it is red. When it giveth its colour in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, at the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. 
Thine eyes shall behold strange woman, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, there shall be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shout they, saying I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. You know, it says, and actually look in Proverbs, um, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs chapter 30, th sorry, 31, Proverbs chapter 31, verse number 4 says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, verse 5, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So kings shouldn't be drinking. Well, the Bible says he has made us kings and priests under God and his Father. We are kings and priests. We're, a, a, you know, a royal nation. You know, a, a, a royal priesthood, it describes us as. And so we shouldn't be involved in this. And it's a, it's a warning for alcohol. And in fact, it actually says in, in, in Habakkuk 2.15, it says, Woe to him that giveth his neighbour drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunk, and also that thou mayest look on their nakedness. This is describing someone giving alcohol to someone. Why? So they can see their nakedness. But notice also even says, Woe to him that giveth his neighbour his neighbour drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayst look on their nakedness. There's an element of even homosexuality within that. But it happens both ways. I mean, how many people are there who've been abused because someone's given them drink, got them drunk, to take advantage of them, to abuse them? You know, and people do it in all sorts of ways now. They'll, they'll, they'll give them drink and they'll give them pills. They'll give them have a bit of this. But there's all sorts of stuff. That, and it's, why would you want to drink when that could happen? It's just, it's a dangerous thing, you know. Um, if I mentioned before about the, the account of Noah. What happened to him? Noah got drunk and something happened that resulted in the whole, he cursed Canaan, his grandson, and all his descendants, which Sodom and Gomorrah, that's where they were. They, they were in the land of Canaan. So that's the second thing. Alcohol, the dangers of alcohol. The third thing is the influence of others. So look back at Joe Genesis 19. Just look at the in influence of others. Because you see, here it talks about, wasn't it the older sibling? Look at it, it says here. Um, and the firstborn said unto the younger. And she's the one who does. And then they made their father drink, da-da-da. And then it came, and then she's, um, she did that. And then he says, yesterday I, I lay with my father, let him drink wine also, and you go in. So the firstborn says, hey, let's do this. She does it, and then she says, now you do this. Okay? And so what she's doing is she's influencing the younger sister. Okay? The, the older sibling, she's like the instigator of this <coughs> horrific sin. She's leading her younger sister astray. Well, we can all influence others. And we can be influenced by others. And the influence could be bad, or it could be good. You know, the Bible says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Okay, it's a real Proverbs 13, 20. It says, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. We need to be careful who we're around. You know, if we're around people who are doing what's wrong and saying what's wrong, it's going to lead us to do wrong. But if you want to do right... Find people that, doing right, that are doing right and hang around them. Be around them and they will lead you to do right. You know, I mean, I mean, that makes common sense. And you could transfer that to any endeavour. You know, I mean, some of you, you know, maybe if you're studying. Do you think if you hung around the deadbeat students who are getting E's, are you gonna, is that going to help you do well? Or what about if you hung about the students who are getting A pluses and are being diligent and working hard? Which is, which is going to help you? You know, it, it's, a, it's a natural thing. Because they're going to help you. Because you, if you hang around them, you'll do what they do, which is study and work hard. And guess what? That means that you're going to do well. You know, it's it's just it's just pure, purely common sense. We should, you know, beware of the influence. Here we see a bad influence, but we can also have a good influence. Finish up last um, couple of verses. Verse number thirty-seven. It says, And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab, the same as the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger, she also bare a son and called his name Ben-Ami, the same as the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. So here we see these names, Moab and Ammon, I mean, they, it says the father of the Moabites. From these, this incestuous thing that happened, two nations actually got born. The Moabites and the Ammonites. And when you read through the Bible, you find the history, how often the children of Israel were fighting battles against these people. You know, a, a whole pile of Moabites came in and, and, you know, big battles go on and lots of people being killed as a result of this. And so that teaches us that 
sin has lasting consequences. It wasn't just this here, but it actually down the track, generations later, people were dying because of what happened here. Because of the alcohol here, because of Lot going to Sodom. Okay, so it's important we understand sin has consequences. So we're all, we're all done. That's, I must admit, that's a pretty, that what we've looked through there, you'd have to describe it as a pretty distasteful chapter in the Bible. Wouldn't you say? I mean, it started pretty bad, and then it finished pretty bad. Okay, it, it's unpleasant, but it's true. And so we need to be aware of the dangers. You see, the world says homosexuality is fine. It says it's harmless. It's not. The world says that alcohol is fine. It's not a problem. You know, drink alcohol. I mean, if you watch, if you watch ads for alcohol, you'll be beautiful. You'll have a six-pack. You'll be a great sports player. Isn't that what it would it say? It's not true. Okay? Sodom and Gomorrah is an example for us today. It's not an irrelevant story. Lot's whole life and that of his family was destroyed because he got too close to sin. Too close to sin. If you take one thing away, remember, stay away from sin. You don't want to, who wants to end up their life, their life like Lot? I mean, how many people call their kid Lot today? I've never met anyone called Lot. It's not, uh, plenty of people called Abraham. Not many people called Lot. You know, it's, it's a warning. It's a warning. Stay away from sin. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Just thank you for the clarity of your word. Lord, sometimes your word, it, it talks about things that are distasteful, things that are vile, things that should turn our stomach. But Lord, we need to know the truth so we can stay away from things that are dangerous, stay away from things that are wrong. Lord, we thank you for the soul saved this week. We thank you for just the many blessings that you give us, Lord. We thank you for, for health and strength and um, thank you once again for the um, for the birthday celebration. And um, yeah, Lord, I just pray that you'd, you'd bless us in this week ahead. Lord, help us to heed the warnings in your word and to walk in a way that pleases you. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.